Good evening, church. We're uh, here on our Wednesday night service. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, please just um, let us know you're watching with us and uh, have some fellowship and visit with each other, encourage each other. Um, we were going to uh, um, spend a little time um, in worship tonight and uh, get back into the word in our study in Zechariah. And so just really looking forward to spending some time together, uh, even though we're not together. Um, but we're going to continue to um, <clears throat> to do a few things. I'll have some more announcements later. Um, just I'm sure there's some curiosities and stuff like that. But for tonight, um, let's go ahead and um, prepare ourselves to worship the Lord in song, and then we'll spend the, um, some time in the Word. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. So Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the grace and the mercy that's in Jesus Christ. We ask that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that you would cause in us, Lord, Lord, just a hunger and thirst for righteousness, Lord, as we hunger and thirst for your word. Lord, would you feed us? Lord, would you be the one that teaches us, Lord? And so would you bring us into that place as we sing to you, Lord, as we offer um, these sacrifices of praise, Lord, that we give our attention to you. And so may you be glorified tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than enough my supply my breath of life still more awesome than I know you are my reward worth living for still more awesome than I know and all of you is more than enough all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough You're my sacrifice of greatest price. Still more awesome than I know. You're my coming King. You are everything. Still more awesome than I know. And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough more than all i want more than all I need You are more than enough for me More than all I know More than all I can say You are more than enough And all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and Satisfied. 
all else to me safe that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my light be thou my wisdom and thou my true word and I ever with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father I thy true son thou in me dwelling and I with thee one be thou my battle shield swords for the fight be thou my dignity thou my delight thou my soul shelter thou my high tide raise thou me heavenward O power of my power riches I heed not nor man's empty praise thou mine inheritance now and always thou and thou only first in my heart I keep of heaven thy treasure thou art high king of heaven my victory won may I reach heaven's joys O bright heaven's sun heart of my own heart whatever be still be my vision O ruler of all and heart of my own heart whatever be still be my vision, O ruler of Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I am your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place 
to feel the warmth of your embrace and help me find a way and bring me back to you you're take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace and help me find a way or bring me back to I'm 
giving up my pride for the promise of new life and I Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that we can take this time, Lord, during the week and make it your time, Lord, when, when it's all your time, all the time, but sometimes we just forget how important, Lord, your, <clears throat> your time with us is, and, and so, Lord, we want to make sure on Wednesdays that we keep it focused, Lord, regroup our, our minds and our hearts and lay them down at your feet. And so we thank you for your great love and what you do for us. And so just bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we have a few announcements. Um, I'm just going to run through them uh, real quick. But one of the things with, with our announcements here is uh, if you're new or you're, you're visiting us on, on the website, we'd love to hear from you. So um, you can contact us at the info at ccclimbafalls.com or you can message us, us on the Facebook Messenger uh, at the church page. Um, and so that's info at ccclimbafalls.com. But we'd love to connect with you. And uh, if you have prayer requests, that's a great place to get those uh, to be put um, in, so that we could be praying for you. Our service times. Um, so so we're, week, we're still streaming our weekly services on Facebook and on our website. You can go there and, um, and, and get linked over. Our, 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 now, this is the, the, the one thing that you have to kind of catch on is for this Sunday, we're going to be moving our, our, our live stream time to 1030 a.m. So normally we do 10 a.m., but we're going to be moving to 1030 a.m. this Sunday and prepare, to prepare for uh, June 14th, so not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, um, we'll be um, having, Lord willing, with, with everything that's supposed to happen, uh, two services, 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. But what I want to communicate now is this Sunday, we'll be live streaming the service 
um, we're going to have some servants here for training. <clears throat> and so we're going to have a little bit of a different look on our live stream, but you'll kind of get a sense of where we're going to be able to go for the following week. So this service is all we are going to have is a 1030 um, Facebook live and, and, um, and, and also on the YouTube and ch church website. So, um, so that's what we got for our time. And then we're going to continue live stream 630 PM on Wednesdays. So we're going to continue this um, f for a time. So, so one of the reasons, you know, that, that we just don't rush back is right now it, it's very just a, it's going to be weird. It's going to be a little odd and there's going to be some realities of family, um, the family aspect in our meetings. So, so what, what's going to happen is I'm going to give a special update. I'll, I'll, I'll do it on Facebook. We'll put it on the, on the website, um, coming up to explain and how those services will be and all those kind of things. Um, looking forward. But there's some people that really need some f to be in fellowship. There's some uh, singles. There's people that um, struggling with addiction, people that I've talked to that just, they need to be in the service. And some of you are doing well outside of that for now, because coming back um, to a family service with a bunch of kids just may not be well, because we'll have to do everything inside. Um, so I just wanted to communicate just you, we're going to be, yes, we're going to open our doors in two weeks um, from Sunday, uh, not from this Sunday, but the following Sunday. But this Sunday is just going to be a live stream, um, except for those that are training to receive them next week. So, um, so anyways, uh, more, more details to come on that. Please visit our website, ccclamaFalls.com. Uh, you can find audio, video of our services, make prayer requests, um, Please visit the, uh, the, the Children's Ministry resource page for devotionals and weekly lessons, um, and you can give online. Uh, the church office is open uh, Monday through uh, Thursday, 9.30 to 2 p.m., <clears throat> uh, so you're welcome to stop by, and uh, if you need prayer, if you need something, uh, need to come by and drop stuff off, just, just come on by um, the church office. Um, if you want to contact the office, you could reach Lexus at office at CC Climate Falls, or you could reach any of the staff patch, pastors at uh, our name and uh, at CC Climate Falls. So like Russ at CC Climate Falls, Aaron at CC Climate Falls, etc. Uh, landscaping work days um, are 9 to 11 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so if you'd like to come by, uh, Gordon and Terry Aguirre are here. They're hosting just times where you could come in and um, pull weeds and do other things, weed whack, whatever. If you'd like to come in at a, a different time or on the weekend, like on Saturdays and stuff, you can reach out and uh, uh, contact the church office or, um, uh, or Aaron at ccclimatefalls.com. Now, um, the junior and uh, senior high youth ministry are having a fellowship and game night. Uh, and so a junior high or a senior high student, um, 6 to 7 p.m. on Thursday. So tomorrow night um, here at, at the church, it's still social distancing, so you'll need to contact Aaron at CC Climate Falls and uh, reach out to him. But, um, but, but they're hosting the, it's just a, a game night and what do you call it, socially distancing acceptable games. <clears throat> and so, uh, so check that out. Um, he also puts out a weekly a Wednesday night, a Wednesday afternoon, I think is when it rolls out, but a, a Bible study for the kids. It's a 10, 20 minutes and uh, check that out. Um, it's on the youth Facebook page uh, in the Calvary Chapel Youth Ministry Facebook page um, as well. So, uh, so you can check that out there uh, if you have kids and connect them in with that. Uh, men's Monday night Bible study uh, is back uh, in the building again. And so men's Monday night study is at 6 p.m. every Monday. Um, meet uh, at the church for a study of the book of Hebrews. And if you'd like to participate, please contact Ed Pease, ed at ccclimafalls.com. And it's, a, it's still a limited Bible study to 25 until they move us up to second phase. Um, but there's room is what I'm told. So don't worry about it. Just make sure you just contact Ed so we can know which place to put you. Um, Ed at CC Climate Falls. Um, and then on uh, Saturday, uh, um, June 13th at 2 p.m., the men are having a barbecue here at the church. Um, come for fellowship, food, and Bible study. You can contact Ed Peace to reserve your seat for the event. We're still at the 25 mark, so please uh, contact him if you want to come to that. Social distancing will be practiced, and so uh, just so you know, but that's Saturday, June 13th, and so come out and, and get some fellowship. 
Now, women's Bible studies are women's uh, are are happening Monday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, here at the church. The ladies are looking at the book of Exodus, and so you can contact Vicki Ream, and her email address is vream at adkinsonengineering.com, and that's for the Monday uh, 6 p.m. here at the church. And then Wednesday mornings at 10:30, they're studying the book of Isaiah and they're reading. Uh, and reading uh, from the Psalms, uh, you can contact Karen Gasway, Karen at ccclamaFalls.com. So please come and join the ladies uh, if, if you want to study God's word and how it applies. And so again, um, those are both 25 and stuff, but from what I'm told, there's room. So please contact Karen, uh, contact Vicki and plug in. And then Saturday um, prayer meeting, um, Saturday evening prayer meeting is 6 p.m. every Saturday, and that's on Zoom. So we, we kind of been doing Zoom and stuff, and even though it's a small group, um, it, it's kind of working out for a handful of people. So if you'd like to participate with the, the, the 6 p.m. Uh, Saturday prayer meeting, um, you can contact Chuck Gasway at cgccclamaFalls.com. And so that's a, a way for you to um, to do this. So that's kind of the announcements. And again, I'm going to, uh, like I said, if you're confused about the services and stuff, I'm going to make a real clear one to you. I will send out an E letter, um, letting you know what's, what's going to happen on our coming up and, um, what we have. But honestly, you know, like the way I feel is it's going to be difficult for some people to come and have to social distance. And so if that's one of you that just, you're not a, you know, you want, you can't be here without hugging and kissing on people. You know, there's a reality that, that, that coming back early may not be really fun, not be the experience that, that will be um, uh, helpful. And at the same time, you may be someone who just really needs to come in because you need prayer, you need fellowship, you need to talk to people. Um, you, you don't mind the social distancing just so that you can have some social aspects. And that's um, what we're going to be doing to open up um, on June 14th for. So, um, so, so, so we'll still be doing the live casting. We'll still be doing all those things. Um, there's no, it's not like the, that you have to be here to do uh, church to feel like it, the obligation and such. You know, it's important that we assemble. Um, but for now, maybe you just get, call some people up and, and watch from the home. Um, watch together. Um, spend some time together. So... Um, so more, more to come with that. But for now, again, Sunday 1030 um, is going to be the time for our service. So I just want to make that in for our live uh, service um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, let's open the book of Zechariah. Um, Zechariah chapter 5 tonight. We get to finish up a section in Zechariah. So um, as we've been studying the book of Zechariah, one of the key elements of the book is, is, is just the fact of how, um, how Zechariah and Haggai were both prophets during the time of the rebuilding uh, of the temple. So after Solomon's temple was sacked, everyone went into captivity, right? All, all, all of Jerusalem, Judah, um, they were taken into Babylon, um, after they come out of Babylon, after 70 years, God promised that he would restore them and that he would bless them, that he had a plan for, for them. And, uh, and so Jeremiah 29, 11 spoke on that plan, that he has plans to prosper them, you know, plans of blessing and peace. And, and so he wants to really uh, encourage them. And so these two prophets came about at a time when it was necessary to rebuild the temple, to get this um, this God's plan in motion. And, and so, um, and so God uses Zechariah and Haggai to do that. And so, um, as we work through this, we, we, we break down the book this way. And so here's the outline. Zechariah 1, 1 through 6 was the introduction, which was return to me. And then Zechariah 1, 7 through, 7, um, <clears throat> 7 through 6, 18 are the eight visions. So, uh, so chapters one through six, basically, were the eight visions. And then uh, Zechariah seven through eight will be the question of fasting, which are four messages. And then nine and 11 are the first burden and uh, 12 and 14 are the second burden. So, so what these are in this outline um, are, are just how we break it down as we read through it. And tonight we're just right there in the eight visions. We'll be finishing up the eight visions tonight. And so, um, 
And so we've already studied f five of the visions. We're going to do six, seven, and eight tonight. Um, but before we jump into to, to verse, um, to chapter five, verse one, um, I want to read a verse to you out of Romans, Romans eight twenty eight. See, right now it's like, do you speak about what's going on in the country? Do you not speak about what's going on in the country? Because you know, it's pretty much if you do, you're just adding to a bunch of commentary and a bunch of ideas that people's opinions, right? And I don't think um, I really need to get more opinion or commentary on what's the events that are going on. I think it's um, very real, very, um, very serious things that are going on um, um, on, on, on every front. Um, but, but so if you don't speak on it, you're, you're in trouble because you're not showing support. And if you do speak on it, um, you're probably going to say something that's going to cause an issue. <laughs> and so it just kind of creates kind of a thing. So as a Christian, where are you tonight? Like in Klamath Falls, right? We even had, a, you know, all those people that were almost, you know, almost a thousand people and all the chaos that's kind of happened downtown a little bit. Well, in other cities, they're blowing things up with tear gas and just all kinds of chaos and stuff's going on. And there's some real, you know, we have the right to protest. And so people have the right to give their voice. I mean, that's praise the Lord for that. You know, um, we don't have the right to riot, you know, that's a, that's breaking the law, you know, but at the same time, there's misgivings on both sides because there's another, you know, force that's coming in that's that's bringing about make, taking something that's peaceful and making it riotous to make one group look bad um, almost to to get the rise and create division and and so you have all these kind of things happening and so you're like I don't know what to do I don't know even know how to speak on the subject because it's just so uh, volatile um, there's just so much going on and so as I pray about it I just was like Lord what what do you want me to share? I, you know, honestly, on this subject of, you know, you know, of, of the reality of racial injustice that's happened and happens continually, um, you know, and how do you speak on one subject and not on all the subjects? Because there's bigger problems in America than just that, I feel. And yet that's the subject. And if you don't address just the single subject, then you're kind of speaking against it is how it comes off. So, so I'm like, Lord, I don't know what, what to do, you know, because I, I honestly, I, until we deal with the abortion issue, I don't think any other issue is an issue. Um, that, that's where I stand on, on the forefront of most of the, the reality, because there's blood on our hands. Until we quit killing our babies, I, I don't understand. Um, and it's very racist. It's probably the most racist thing that's happened um, in our country. But, but this is what the Lord has given me, and I think it ties into what we're going to study tonight. So Romans 8, 28. Um, I shared this with a gentleman today, and it reminded me, it was one of the first verses my mom shared with me as a kid. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And, and the key element of this, now a lot of people know the first half, right? All things work together for good. That's how humanist we'd like it to be. That's the optimistic way to live life, right? But there's some qualifiers in Romans 8 that says, and this is all things work together for good to those who love God and, are, and to those who are called according to his purpose. And I think the fact that it's his purpose, right? What, what is his purpose in our lives rather than what I want to get God on my side, what I want to get the crowd on my side and my voice, right? What is his purpose? Now, a lot of people want to speak for God into that, what that is. And I think the idea is, is we who are the called, right? Those who are called, chosen, saved. Those who are believers, right? Who love God, right? Would be about his purpose. That we'd be about his will be done. And I think we all have our cultural battle that we all have to deal with. Our society has issues, and we should be a part of that conversation. We should be a part of that, but only as far as it goes into God's purposes. Anything beyond that is a humanistic ideology to, that's probably being pumped up by some political um, um, 
alter, alteration of society. Somebody wants to tweak society in a political direction, and you're just going to be tugged one way or the other. And, and I think for us, we need to be so focused on his purpose, and he's made his purpose known to us. And I think to love God, to love others is who we are, right? That's his purpose in our lives, to conform to the image of Christ. And then to make disciples is what we should be about doing, right? Making disciples who love God and love others. Because, you know, if we had a, a country filled with that, we wouldn't have the problems that we do. Um, and, and, and I think to understand that he has an overarching purpose going on, that even in the things that we go, well, that's a shame and it shouldn't be happening, like the riots and different things, you know, he has a purpose in all of that. He, he is doing something bigger than we can see. And so we always have to be considerate of God's purpose in what? If, if America goes down, God forbid, in our generation, right? It's because God purposed it to go down. It's, he's sovereign. He's in control, right? But God forbid that it would be because, right? <laughs> because of me or because of you doing foolish things, right? Not voting, doing what we need to do. So we have a responsibility, but we have peace knowing that God is going to fulfill his purpose, so, so that means if you understand that it's going to work out for good, this is going to work out for good for you who love God, who are the called, and it's going to work out according to his purpose. So let's go to Zechariah, and I'll show you a little bit of, in this how, how God has a big purpose, a big plan for Israel, and then how he speaks to those who are um, there in Zechariah's day how that applied to them and how these future prophecies apply to future generations, especially Israel, and how that's going to work out in this world that we live in now. And, 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 and it's interesting how these things go, hmm, that's interesting. It looks like it's headed that direction. And, and there's a great hunger for that. So, so let's pray and then we'll jump in. So Father, we thank you, Lord. Just thank you for the eight visions. We pray, Lord, as we finish them up tonight, that you would be glorified. Lord, we want to be about your business, not about our business, Lord. We want to uh, have you help us, Lord, to direct our business into your business. And, and, and we're thankful, Lord, that you care about the situations that we're in. Lord, you don't, you don't just move in your own direction without caring for us and ours because you, the Bible says that while we were still yet sinners, you died. So you came even when we were going our own way, reached in to bring us about, to bring us into your purposes. So we thank you for the love you've demonstrated. We thank you, Lord, for the care that you have, Lord, and that you have a plan, that the, that the world and in in all the, the, the turmoil and chaos, Lord, you have a plan through the pandemic plan, through the, the, the issues, through this election year. Lord, you have a plan in all of that. And so will you help us to see your plan more clearly and, and understand our, our role? So we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So then the eight vision. So chapter five, one through four is the sixth vision, vision of the flying scroll. Vision six, vision of the flying scroll. And we read in chapter five, verse one, it says, then I turned and raised my eyes and I saw there a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And so I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and it's width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse um, that goes out over the fa uh, face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of the scroll. And I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of the house and consume it, with its timber and stones. So in verses one and two, it's, it's, again, it says, then I turned and raised my eyes and saw a flying scroll. <laughs> so, so he's having visions, right? It's like a dream, except you're awake, you know, and he sees this big flying scroll. And I would say this is not just any flying scroll, because what do you see? So I answered, I see, I see a flying scroll, and its length is 20 cubits, and its width is 10 cubits. And so a cubit's kind of an elbow to the hand. It's about approximately about 17.6 or 18 inches, right? So, so a cubit, you know, times 10, that's the width, right? And times 20 
is the length. So that's a big flying scroll, right? That, that, that would be like, whoa, look at that thing. And, and the Bible talks about scrolls. We see it in Ezekiel chapter 2 about a scroll that's been given and he has to eat this scroll. And in Revelation, the same kind of thing. And so it talks about scrolls in different visions. Um, but but it's, just, it's just interesting that, that, that there's this big flying scroll, right? <laughs> Excuse me. And then again in verse 3, he says, Then he said to me, This is the curse that, uh, that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of the scroll. And I will send out the curse. So, so you see this big flying curse scroll, right? And, and it's two-sided. On one side, right, side one, it has every thief shall be expelled. So you get a sense that that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? And, and, and it's the Eighth Commandment, um, which deals with how man treats man how man treats man. And in fact, on those commandments, in the middle is this, is this one, the th- thieving. And so how man treats man is on the, you know, on the one side, and, and it signifies every thief shall be expelled. On the other side, flipped over, every perjurer shall be expelled, or one who, fi- who swears falsely by my name. That's what he's, really what he's saying there. The perjurer is one who swears falsely by God's name, which is the third commandment. And, and the first part of the commandments, the first half deal with how man's relationship with God and how man sins against God. These are the commands that you could be right with God by not doing these. And so you have, and that's the middle commandment of the, the, the vertical ones, if you will, the vertical ones between us and God and the, and the ones on the other side is the middle one that has to do with man, uh, how, how we treat one another. And so the Lord of hosts sends out this curse uh, and it enters into the house of both of them. And it's going to do things into the house of those who are the, the, those who are the thieves and those who are the perjurers, if you will. And so this curse of the law of these two commandments. Now we understand the way the Bible describes is there was blessings and cursings, right? But the law itself can be a curse to those, right? Because there, there is no salvation in the law, right? There was no redemption in the law. There was no justification. No man could be made right with God according to the law. And so the picture kind of represents the whole law, but, but focuses in on, on do not steal, right? And do not bear fault, um, uh, do not use the Lord's name or in vain or bear false witness against your neighbor. So, so you get these two pictures. So Galatians, if you want to turn over to the book of Galatians chapter 3, Paul picks up on this and he applies this to the Christians who, who have a tendency to, go, to be pulled back and called into law because some people want to regulate and, and put us back into the old covenant, but but the reality is, is as Christians, we're in a new covenant, right? And so in Galatians 3.10, it says this, For as many as there are, are of works of the law uh, are under the curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that... No one just is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. And then in verse 12, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So, so the Bible basically says, and if you try to keep the law, cursed are you unless you keep all of the law. And it's interesting. We have one picture of one part of the law Do not steal on one side, right? Dealing with man to man. And then on the other side is how we deal with God, bearing, uh, swearing falsely. So so here you have these major issues um, of trying to keep the law, right? And and because if you just break one of them, um, you know, you're, you're under the curse of the law. 
Now in verse 13, it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So we know that that Christ has redeemed us from the law, right? Christ has what? Come and fulfilled the law, not... Not one jot, not one tittle would be removed until what? He fulfilled the law. So Christ fulfills the law and and he lives ever before, you know, the father making intercession for us. But it was because of his blood and redemption that now we're removed from the law that's taken away from us. So we're no longer under curse, but now we're under blessing. So Gentiles get brought into this blessing. Um, And so that's why it's important that we stay focused on the new covenant and don't try to seep into the old covenant in those ways. But but because of their covenant relationship, right, they're now under sin because of of, of judgment uh, for what they were breaking. And so so because of this, now going back in Zechariah, it will consume their houses, right? Notice there it's, it will consume, it'll consume them. Um, and it goes out and, and, and notice how it goes into the home and then it, 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 it remains in the middle of the home and then consumes it with its timber and stones. And, and so, um, so we know some of the prophecies of Haggai at the same time, we're talking about how they were failing to build up the Lord's house, but they were taking care of their own homes. And, and, and so there was issues and such. But, but one of the problems of, of, of sin is when, when people are trying to um, make themselves right by, God, by God's law, um, it will bring a curse upon you if you don't come by faith. And so that was the major sin that now the curse of judgment that God would judge sin in that way. But for us as Christians, praise the Lord for Jesus, right? He's brought us in peace, right? He's removed that from us so that, that even though we're sinners and we deserve the curse, it's been removed from us, instead given to us blessing. And I think sometimes we have to just give, give us the break of going, wow, Lord, thank you for just giving me blessing, even though I deserve the curse, even though I recognize. But I'm not gonna try to get there by keeping rules or keeping the law. I'm gonna get there only through Jesus Christ. And that's the place I have to go to. Not my own works, not my own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He makes me right with God. He's our righteousness. He's our justification. So back to chapter five now. The vision of the woman in a basket, vision seven. And so in verse five, it says, then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, lift your eyes now and see what is that that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it is a basket that is going forth. And he also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. And so he's going to go ahead and describe it. But before we do that, we have to do a little bit of language work here. Um, The word for basket um, is translated, in the New American Standard, it has um, an ephah. And, and what an ephah was, uh, was the measurement for wheat. And so, so when they would say so many ephahs of wheat, it was a measurement. And usually it would be contained into a basket. And so, so the translators kind of had to, to work with that one a little bit. And so your, your, your measurement for wheat was an ephah or these baskets. And, and, so, um, and so, so this is going to be about the commerce, about the economic commerce of the nation, of, of a nation. And so here, uh, they have this basket, and it's going forth. And, and, and notice it says, he also said, this is their resemblance throughout the whole earth. Now in verse 7, he says, here is the lead disc lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, uh, this is wickedness. He, uh, and, and he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. And so, so now you have this lead disc lifted up, right? And, this, and he says, this is a woman sitting in the basket. So he pulls this lead disc out, and now there's this woman sitting in the basket and saying, see, look at this. 
right? And, and so you want to know the interpretation? This is wickedness. And so putting a lead disc in the basket would what? Would weight down the, the, the weights. And so you would have less in your basket if you were doing merching, uh, you know, if you're, you're, if you're doing sales and different things. So it has to do with dishonest scales, with um, disproportionate weights and balances. And so they were stealing, right, from those they would do commerce with. Um, and so when you, when you see this, it's just like really weird, you know, that he sees this basket, then all of a sudden this, and I, I think another translation says, instead of just a lead disc, uh, it says a talent of lead <laughs> was in the basket. So like most of the time, a talent was like a measurement of about 75 pounds of gold. If it was a talent of gold, that's a lot of, a lot of gold and such. So it was a, a measurement of lead that was sitting in the basket with the woman. And he says that basically this is wickedness. And he thrusts her down in the basket and he throws the lead as a cover over the basket, uh, over its mouth. And so, so we have the first part of the vision interpretation of how wickedness in the economy and the commerce of the country would end up being judged by its methods, right? So if they're robbing others, judgment would come upon uh, those who robbed others, you know, by they themselves being robbed. Um, and so judgment was going to happen because of this sin. And then in verse 9, it says, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming uh, <clears throat> with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up a basket between earth and heaven. And so I said to the angel uh, who talked between the earth, uh, who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, uh, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar when it uh, is ready and the basket will be set there on its base. And so now we have these two women and, 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 and the two women are coming with the wind in their wings. So they're winged women, right? And not any type of wings, wings like a stork, right? Carrying, and, and, and they're carrying the basket, right? And they're delivering babies. Now, that's the image right, that you kind of get a sense like, what's going on here, you know? But he sees this reality. Now, when you think of winged women, the picture there has to do with some kind of angelic being, something, something that's doing a, a work there. Because um, most of the winged um, creatures either are angels or demons um, in the scriptures, right? Either angels or fallen angels. And, and they come and they lift up the basket, right? And they take it and, and they move it. So they move it out of one place and they move it to another. And notice, where does they take it? Uh, they're carrying the basket. And he says, where are they carrying the basket, right? And he, said, uh, and he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. Now, now Shinar is, is the place where... Um, the, the Tower of Babel was built. That was the first place where Babylon, and, and, and that was the place, and so through the scriptures, it talks about Shinar um, being that place. And so, so this, what, way of the economy, right, this, this way of commerce is going to be moved to a place in a physical location of Shinar, or where was Babylon, and so uh, this is where a lot of people believe in the end times when we read about mystery Babylon in that great city, right? And Revelation, this is where the interpretation would go because it's given a physical description of where it's at being in a Shinar with a different name. Um, and, and, and so, so it's physical historical location of Babylon, which would be in e modern day Iraq. And we talked a little bit about that um, in the beginning. We went, went through and gave some history on Iraq and, and Babylon and such. And, 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 and there's, you know, it's just one, one of those ways of you see, okay, this could actually be actually rebuilt in Babylon, and it'll become the economic commerce city of the world. Now, what we read in Mystery Babylon, when it goes down, all the merchants of the world will be saddened and weeping because that's where they did, that's where they sold, that's where they bought, that's where that happens. So this is the place where, where that will be, and, and it will be what? They will get rich, right? The Antichrist will become rich, you know, in his, in his uh, headquarters and center by, by having a wickedness in the way he does commerce, whether it's through monopoly, whether it's through... Uh, however it's done. 
that's going to happen, and it's going to be in those headquarters there. And so the point of the vision is that the wickedness of deceitful gain in commerce will find its way to the future capital city of the world, and that's how they'll become rich. And so that, that's kind of the vision and the point that, that's made. And I'm going to go over all the visions and kind of give you kind of the, the layout in just a minute. But, um, and, and so, uh, and, and I think, you know, in those days, as they would have heard that, they would have recognized this, this reality of what, you know, be careful as you build your commerce. Be careful. Don't try to get ahead of the game um, th- through, through um, dishonest weights and scales. Uh, because that is wickedness. And, and, and I think today we have to be very careful that we don't try to get ahead by cheating the system, cutting corners, um, because we understand that that is a wicked act and it hurts people. It hurts people. So let's go to chapter six now. In verse one through three, now, chapter 6, actually 1 through 8, is the vision of the four chariots, uh, and it will be vision 8. And, and so before God's going to establish his messianic kingdom, he will first judge the Gentile nations that oppress Israel. So let's look there in verse 1. 1 through 3, it says, Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains. And the mountains were uh, mountains of bronze, with the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot uh, white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses, um, strong steeds. And so now we have horses that show up again. If you remember in the first vision, there was four horses that went out to, to view and to scout the world and see what was going on. And when they came back, as they came back from the Gentile nations, yes, that was evil and sin, just as uh, was supposed, right? Well, here now there are four chariots that go out, and 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 as we'll find out, these will be agents of God. We'll 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 see a little bit um, more in just a minute. But then there's two mountains. Notice that they and the mountains were of mountains of bronze, and so um, and so the four chariots were coming from between two mountains. In the end times, when God does judge the Gentiles and the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is a valley between the Mount of Olives and Mount Moriah, uh, the Valley of Jehoshaphat is where the Gentile nations will be ultimately judged and, and such. So it's believed possibly with bronze being uh, a, as a representation of judgment. And that could be what that, that's meaning. But, but here, he, notice he gives us chariots of red horses and black horses, white horses, and dappled or grizzled horses. Um, and all four of them all had strong steeds. And so um, in Revelation 6, it talks about the f- four horsemen, right, who have similarities, right? But at the same time, they have differing purposes. And so, so when these things go out, um, you know, we understand that, that there's, you know, they have a purpose in them, and, and usually it's described with each event to, to understand what they mean. And so the idea is, is one thing about the horses is that they travel quickly, that they could go out throughout the, the whole earth. Um, and the first vision really kind of hammered out the reality that, that God has sent out the four horsemen of Zechariah to look out all over the earth and see if the Gentiles were ripe for judgment. Um, you know, and, and so let's look at verse four now and see what the interpretation is given to us. And it says, then, an, then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Thank you, Zechariah, for that, right? And the angel said, uh, answered and said to me, these are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country. The white are going after them and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro uh, throughout the earth. And he said, go and walk to and fro throughout the whole earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the whole earth. And he called to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. So what does that mean, right? (laughs) Thanks for the interpretation. Now, where are they going? They're going, some going north, some are following those, right? 
the black ones are going north and the white ones are following after, right? And then the dappled, right, the grizzled ones are going towards the south country, right? And then, and then the other group, the strong steeds, right, they're eager to go and they, that they might go throughout the whole earth, that they're going to go all over the place. And so how do I understand? Well, it tells us one key element there. These are the four spirits or winds of heaven. That phrase is so important that you grasp because it's mentioned in Daniel. And Daniel's not that far away from Zechariah. Dan- Zechariah would have had Daniel's prophecies. He would have understood from Daniel. So if you look back in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had dreams and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And so it would probably have been understood that the four winds of heaven are now described as what? Chariots, right? And, and, and these are angelic agents or beasts, right, that, that go throughout the earth, right? And so when, when and in Daniel 7, these four winds stir up four great beasts, and those four great beasts would be these um, consecutive nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, and then Rome. And so these beasts, these king and kingdoms would come through, right? And, and they would happen, and they all had to do with, with the, the times of the Gentiles. And, and, and that's kind of the theme of Zechariah, is like what's going to happen to Israel in the times of the Gentiles, and what's to be the fruition at the end, and the second coming of Messiah that ends that, at the end of that time. And so, so when you think about these four great beasts and you correlate that with these images, the black horses go to the north country. The north country would be Babylon throughout Isaiah and Jeremiah. All the, 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 the judgment that's coming from the north and this army from the north w- was speaking of Babylon and that God would send Babylon in to deal with them, right? And, and, and the first of the visions that, that Babylon would be the first nation and then they would be conquered by another nation that had an inferior leadership, but, but they would be conquered by them. And so we see that the, the next ones would be what? Another Northern one. And so the white horses that went up would be Medio Persia, right? And, and, and so you, you start to see uh, these pictures. Now, while these things are taking place, what does he tell them? What does he tell them again in that, in that section? And, and he says, these are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country and the white are going after them and the dappled are going to the south. The strong seas went out, right? But at the very end there in, in verse eight, he says, see those who go to the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. Meaning God has fulfilled the work there. Babylon was conquered. They rose, they did what they were supposed to do. Then God judged them because of the way they treated his people and raised up another nation, right? And then what happened? Medo-Persia came in and they judged them, right? And, and, And then now what? Now things are going to decline, in the media. So now the Lord's saying, see, my plan and my purposes are coming to pass. And so all the plans that I gave you that's going to go down are going to come to pass. And so he, he shows them this reality. And then going to the south would be what? Well, that's where the Hellenistic groups was, was taking place and they were going to be raised up. And, um, and, and that's the Greek empire. You know, and they were preparing to come, which was the next phase of the plan. But all of these strong steeds, and, and if you go back to the first one, probably speaking, including the red horses, deal with the, the reality of the fourth empire, which is that coming future world empire that's going to be all over the world, not just to the north and not to the south, but to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. And, 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 and so God has judged, right, this nation. He said he would, and he did. God is judging this nation. He's raising up, so he's at rest with what he's doing here. 
The future ones are going to happen just like he planned and just like he did in place. So God's program is moving on. That, that's the point, is God's program is moving on and he will judge the Gentile kingdoms just like he promised he would, right? And, and what's the end result, right? In Daniel, we know the end result, that there will be a final nation, right? That'll take all the pieces of all the nations, but they will be like, like, like a Roman empire, but they'll be mingled with clay. It'll be broken up. It'll be different. And do what's going to happen is a stone is going to come and hit the statue at the feet, but it'll be God, the Son, coming to what? Destroy the final right? Kingdom. Revelation tells us Jesus returns, destroys the Antichrist, right? Mystery Babylon is defeated. All, you know, all the things that are culmination of the Gentile kingdoms and the times of the Gentiles will end. And then God will save that remnant of Jews. And so, so God's program is moving on. So let's do an overview real quick. <clears throat> I'm going to give you those, those eight um, those eight visions and just kind of like just bring them together. So the first vision, God was angry with the Gentile nations, right? That was the first vision. As he went out, he was angry because he sent out the horses, right? And then he intended to, in the second vision, he intended to show mercy to Israel, right? He's, he's promising, I'm going to show mercy to Israel. And then the third vision that he was, again, um, angry with the Gentiles. He, he, he is upset with them, right? And then fourth uh, is the promise of a restoration of Jerusalem. And so in the, that was in the fourth vision. And in order for the fourth vision to happen, these next things have to happen first. So the fifth vision deals with the confidence in the priesthood that it needed to be restored. Then also the confidence of civil authority. And we saw that in the fifth, the fifth vision. The Zerubbabel and Joshua, right? These, were, these would be restored. And the sixth vision, we see the removal of the sinner. And then in the seventh vision, we saw what? The removal of sin. And so we see what? All who what? Break the commandments with man and the commandments with God. Those, those, both sides of that flying big scroll, right? Man is going to be dealt with and removed. And then what? Not only the sinner, but also the sin itself will be removed from the land. So it'll be taken from Israel and put where? In, in, in the land of Shinar, right? <laughs> Wherever that is, right? Well, we believe Babylon. And, and I believe that would be where Mr. Babylon, that's where that headquarters would be, right? And so, so the removal of the sin, <clears throat> and then what? And then the eighth vision is the cycle of how God is going to judge, right? Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, Rome, and then that final continuance of Rome, which is that imperialistic um, empire. Uh, God's going to judge them, and in a, in, a, in a final way, He will bring that about and end it. <clears throat> and so that's kind of the the eight visions. So we so we kind of finished that part. Now we just have this last um, um, verses nine through fifteen, which is the crown um, and the temple. And so this is just a segue between the next division, which is going to uh, deal with the, 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 uh, the questions of fasting and such and going into the next. So this is kind of the split of the book here. Um, and, and it's interesting, right in the middle of Zechariah's prophecies, in the middle of the book, we have the crown and the temple, which is a really sweet picture um, of Jesus. And that's why I, I just really love Zechariah and, and, and how we see so much of Christ. So now, in verse nine through in, in, in verse nine it says, "Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, "Receive the gift from the capital, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah, or Jedidiah. Jedidiah. So if you if you didn't like Jedidiah for a name for a ch- for a son, here's another one, Jedidiah. Okay, so there you get you get one little nugget there. Anyways. These three guys who have come from Babylon and go to the same uh, go to the go the same day and enter the house of Josiah the son of Zephaniah, take the silver and the gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And so, the command, the word of the Lord, came to Zechariah, right? And and Zechariah is told to receive the gift 
from the captives. So maybe these guys had showed up and said, hey, we want to give you gold, (laughs) right? We want to give you the gift. Um, And they all are staying at the house of Josiah, um, the son of Zephaniah. And he says, take the silver and the gold and make an elaborate crown, right? And set it on the head of Joshua, the high priest, right? And so, so he's commanded to receive this gift. And maybe he didn't know why are they bringing him this gift? What's the purpose of this gift, right? And so as he seeks the Lord, the Lord gives him this clear, clear, clear thing is, I want you to make a crown and put it on the head of Joshua uh, and the high priest. And so this is a symbolic action uh, that's going to, precede a future event that's going to happen in the future. But for their day, it was, a, it was an event and, and it's going to show and reveal that God is with them to build the temple. Because at the end, they're going to be asked to take that crown and make it as a symbol in the temple of what God had done. <clears throat> and so, so it'll be an important thing. But then from this picture of what they're supposed to do with these guys and, and what Zechariah was supposed to do with, with, with Joshua. And verse 12 now, it speaks of the future event that's coming. And it says this in verse 12, then speak to him saying, thus says the Lord of hosts saying, behold, the man whose name is the branch from his place, he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be um, between them both. So he says to make this prophecy known, right? This needs to happen. Behold the man named the branch. Again, we've studied the branch and in Isaiah and different places and spots. And one of the things that the branch would be is the man. And I think it's important, it was important to understand that the branch and the Messiah would be a man. So God would become flesh. He would become human. Philippians 2 says, though he did not find it, you know, robbery to be equal with God, right? He didn't have to hold on to that position that he would come and take the form of, of a bond servant in the form of a man. So he comes and he puts on, so he adds a human nature to, the, to himself in that way. And, and so it's a hypostatic union, all God, all man, the Messiah would be. Necessary for our salvation, right? Uh, he needed to be both. And so here this speaks of Christ's humanity, right? And, and, and though he would have this miraculous um, birth, right, in, 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 in conception, he would be born in a very humble way. And so out of that humble place, he would branch out. He would come out of that. And some people tie that to, to, to Nazareth and being the branch and meaning Netzer and stuff like that. And, and they use this passage for these things. But for, from his place, he'd branch out and that he would build a temple and so that he would burst forth in a sense. Now, what I see here is that he is going to build the temple of the Lord, of Yahweh, meaning the millennial temple, right? Yes, we understand Jesus pointed to his own body and said, take this temple and, you know, tear it down. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And we, and we believe that. And the church right now, we are the body of Christ and we are that temple that God is building together, right, in that time. But there is a future temple, the third temple that is being going to be built. The plans are made. Um, we talked about the menorah last week, right, that big seven-branched candlestick um, of oil. And if you go to Jerusalem today, they have this, uh, this literal menorah that they're going to put in the third temple already built out of pure gold in this big bomb-proof glass thing in the Jewish quarter. It's quite a sight to see. You could stand up and look at it. It's just huge, and it's amazing, right? So they're preparing for their third temple, but, the, but that's the one that, that the Antichrist is going to desecrate, and it's going to be uh, removed, and then a, a, a fifth, uh, what is it, fifth, fourth temple will be built, uh, Ezekiel's temple, um, and, and, and it will be built in the millennium by the Messiah. 
So much so that what? It's voiced twice for emphasis. He shall build the temple of the Lord, um, and he shall build the temple. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. And the third thing here is it says he will bear the glory. And that means that he will be both what? Man and God, because God will what? See, no flesh shall glory in his presence. So it's tied together that you can't bear glory, right, and be a man. You can't have the glory of God unless you are God in the flesh. And so you see that picture there. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he will be the king, right? And, and that's important that he will have kingly functions. And that is super important that we see Jesus Christ. And you saw it there, right, on the cross, king of the Jews, right? For all the world to see. And, um, and when he comes back, he will be the king of the Jews for all the world to see. It, it, it'll be quite amazing. And then, and besides his kingly functions, being king of kings and lord of lords, he will also have there and he shall be a priest on his throne. So this would be a problem in the old covenant because you could not be a Levite and a Davidic one. It just wouldn't, you had to be a certain son of a certain son and such. And the king was going to have to be a certain son of a certain son. And, and so it's very clear that they would be separated the kingly functions and the priestly functions. This was one of the major problems in, in what we call the silent period in between the, the time when the Malachi, this is his last prophecy, to the time when Messiah shows up, John the Baptist and all that. In the time there, they, the, they, had, they had priests, right? And they had governors, but they were never able to re, really figure it out because the, the priests would rule. And they kept thinking, well, maybe the priests should be on the throne. But they could never agree. So much so that right before in, in, in that 400-year in that per period, but before Messiah came, they actually handed over in the Hasmonean dynasty that they, they, had, they had sovereignty but they didn't keep it for very long because they handed it right back to the Rome, Romans because the, they couldn't have a priest ruling over them. <laughs> That's how divided it was. You know? And so, so, there's, so there was just a lot of tension in the ruling parties and the priests. And yet here we see what? He'll, he'll rule on his throne and, and so he shall be a priest on his throne, right? And we see very clearly what order of priesthood will he be? Well, in the new covenant, he will be of the, uh, of the order of Melchizedek, right? Because he'll be like Melchizedek in Hebrews, it tells us. And so he'll have both kingly functions and priestly functions, being the high priest. And, and the end of it is, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So he's able to bring peace both for the ruling of Israel, so as Messiah, but also the reality of both that he brings in both. So, so in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So that's Israel speaking. They're saying unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Son is a position, not just not just a, a like a, a kid, a, a son is being the position of the eternal son. In Psalm 2, you could read in there, it talks about the son, and it speaks of the son of God. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, meaning his ruling uh, kingship, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's what Jesus brings uh, uh, to his people. And so now in our last two verses, let's finish up. Um, if you have any prayer requests, uh, put them in now. That way we can um, look at those and, and pray at the end here. And it says in verse 14, Now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for Halim, Tobijah, and Jediah, the Hin, and Hin, the son of Zephaniah, even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if, if you diligently, diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. 
And so now back for the short term, for the, for, for the prophecy of Zechariah and the builders of his day, as he's encouraging them to build, the Lord told him to receive the gift, make the crown, but the ground would be what? A memorial for the temple. So once, the, once it's built, once the temple is done, that crown that was on Joshua's head would become a memorial in the temple that they would place it there. And it would be for who? For all of those, because what they're doing is they're calling the people back from Babylon. They're calling them to come back and build the temple. Let's go, let's, let's do this. And, and so he calls them to come back and participate, right? Because they needed to be obedient to what God had asked them to do. And so it's interesting to me how God in his sovereignty, who's working it all together, because he's got the big plan and he has the right and the might and the power to do so. Yet he involves his people to participate, right? He involves them to bring about his will to be done on earth. And, and it's interesting that he calls them and he says, and this shall come to pass if you do diligent, if, dil, if you diligently obey the voice of the, of, of the Lord your God. If you want to see these far prophecies happen, be obedient now. That's what he's saying to them. And so they needed to be obedient to have what? Jerusalem restored, the millennial kingdom, a Messiah, the branch, who's going to be the king and the priest, and he will deal with sin and sinners, and he will deal with the nations and the Gentiles, right? All the things, and, and, and these are not things that are just mentioned here. Throughout the scriptures, throughout the minor prophets we've been studying, the major prophets we've been studying, the New Testament, we understand God is going to bring about judgment upon sinners, right? Right? And, and what he's going to do is go, he's going to use us, people who have faith in the gospel and believe, to be a light unto the Gentiles. And he's going to do that through his spirit, right? And in the end, he's going to do this again with the Jewish people. He's going to accomplish what it is. But notice, he wants us to be engaged. He's going to do it. You know, he's sovereign. He's going to do it. It's not a problem for him, right? But I think he wants us to understand we have a part in that. So where are you at today, right? In, in the chaos and the turmoil of your world and the world around you, right? What is your part that you should have faith and obedience in? Because I don't think our commands have changed. I don't think what God's called us to do has changed very much. He's called us to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And we can only do that if we have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And when you love God, do you know what he does? He redirects that love to others. He commands us to love one another as he loved us. And, and you can't do that without him in your heart, without him leading and in, in, in doing this. And then he calls us to make disciples of all the nations, right? And so he wants us to be what? People who love. And I think right now, that's what the world needs. You know? And so what does that look like? Well, that means I have to put up with and be kind to right? What people are doing all over the country. Rather than getting frustrated and, and lashing out with words, remember we talked on Sunday how tough that is, right? To hold back the words and say the right ones. I think God would have Christians not allow ourselves to slip back into the flesh and lash out because we're frustrated with what's going on. But he would rather have us be loving and engaging people personally rather than talking generally about everything. Because I tell you, I've already heard enough commentary and opinion on it. I don't know about you. What we need, though, is more Jesus. And we need prayer, right? And that's where we're going to go to. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings. Lord, we thank you that you are the true High Priest and that you love us. Lord, we look... Um, because you're the one who gives us a glorious future, Lord. Just as you um, had a plan then, you still have a plan now. And so, Lord, would you just meet us tonight, Lord, that we'd be about your business, Lord, that we would see that, that we need to first and foremost love you back. Because you first loved us now, Lord, we ought to live our lives unto you. And so we need your help with that. So please, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, would you cause us, Lord, to be um, all about your business? And so, God, help us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. 
And Lord, just would you help us to understand that you're, it's not by might, not by power, but by your spirit that you're going to accomplish, Lord, all that you do. Just as you sent it up in the north and you dealt with the Babylonians and you were dealing with the Medo Persians, Lord. And we know from our perspective, Lord, just, Lord, that you dealt with Greece and you dealt with Rome, Lord, and, and you're dealing with what's going to happen, Lord. You're going to be about your business. So will you help us just to be about you? And then as you redirect our attention and our focus, Lord, that you redirect our priorities, Lord, may we get on page with you and that we'd have faith to obey so that we might be participants of what you're doing to bring in this world. And so will you help us as the church, Lord, as you want your gospel to go forth? You want people of all nations, Lord, of all races and ethnicities, Lord. You want them all to come to Jesus. Because unto Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess you as Lord. So may we be about your business tonight. And so that means, Lord, as we go to to pray, that you would encourage us, Lord, that you would cause us, Lord, to, to, to really understand that we have to put it back into your hands, Lord, and that we have to spend that time to get our our directions from you. We have to spend time in your word to understand uh, how, how we can, can understand your, how you would direct us, Lord, what that would look like, and that we might know you more. And so fill us afresh. Lord, cause us to do. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go into, I uh, just want to pray for, the, for those who, who put their prayer requests up. Um, And so let's go ahead and pray together. And so I want to lift up Gerilyn, Lord, for healing and strength for her uh, treatments and for her lung cancer, Lord, that you just come alongside her and um, their whole family, Lord, that you just would heal, God, uh, help those treatments to come through without um, too many side effects, Lord, and um, and that you just would bring about peace in their home and that they would all know you. Lord, I, I, we pray for Ocean, and we're thankful, Lord, for her and, uh, and that she gets to come home. From, she's home from the hospital and that she's feeling good. So, Lord, would all the, the, the healing that she needs, Lord, would take place and that she would just feel your blessing and encouragement. Lord, we pray for Stephanie, Lord, just um, um, that she'd be able to keep you first in her life, Lord. For Alyssa's dad, Pete, who got diagnosed with COVID, and even though he's feeling great, Lord, um, just would you be with them? And, and for her mom, who's tested, but we'll know Friday, just, um, Lord, just would you be with that family and give peace to Alyssa? Lord, we pray for Mandy's friend, Sarah, um, and, and, uh, and that you would be with Tyler, uh, Tyler's family, uh, Tyler who passed away for his family and for Mandy uh, and just for comfort, and that you would be with her brother to, to find his way. Lord, we pray... Um, for healing with all that's going on in the world, Lord, for those who are in pain, Lord, uh, who, who are sharing their pain um, from whatever they, they're experiencing from this, Lord, that, um, Lord, that you would be their comforter. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would address the problems, Lord, that, that are brought up, Lord, and so, Lord, would you fix the injustices of race and, and, and the situations of both the reasons why, um, Lord, that, that certain police get jaded and become racist and, 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 and wrong, Lord. Um, Lord, would you, Lord, just in, the, in that sin. And at the same time, Lord, just help those communities, Lord, that there would be no um, violence within those communities so there wouldn't be such a, a, a weight um, on the police forces. And so, Lord, just we, we ask for your help uh, for Liz and Jeremiah for comfort and peace and provision. Lord, we pray for baby Benjamin, um, who's almost ready for a release coming out, Lord, just as he's been in the NICU for so long, Lord, just um, thank you for that, Lord. And we pray for Lee's family member, Roger, who had valve replacement in his heart. Um, and uh, even though the surgery went awry, Lord, you still restored him. Uh, we pray for God's will to be done in his life and healing. We're thankful that he believes in you. Lord, we pray for our president, uh, and we pray for his administration. Lord, we pray for, Lord, the, the Congress and, and, and our local state 
Um, we, pr we pray for Governor Brown and um, the legislative branch, Lord, and for the judicial system in, in Oregon, Lord, that, um, Lord, that you would just save her, that she'd come to know you, Lord, that she would uh, seek the Prince of Peace to bring peace, Lord, here, and, um, and give her wisdom, Lord, and, and, and the people that work for her wisdom, Lord, to figure out how to get us reopened safely and um, and Lord, just um, we pray for Michelle, for her arm that's really sore from dialysis. Lord, that you would just bless her and encourage her. Lord, I pray for Regina, who was diagnosed with cancer and had surgery and now has to go to, uh, to um, chemo. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would be with her and her husband, Lord, that they would both put their trust in you. God, for their whole family, Lord, as they, they struggle with this. Lord, we want to pray for our brother Craig and the loss of his mom, that you just would um, comfort him and, their, and his family. Um, and, and Lord, just uh, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. And, um, and so God, just we, we ask, Lord, that you would heal up Avon, Lord, and um, that you just lift him up and strengthen him as he recoups from his surgery. We pray for uh, um, um, just for the, the Rogers family and um, be with them as well, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, just as we've come to this time now, Lord, just uh, we thank you for our Wednesday time together. And so would you be blessed and, and glorified, Lord, um, thank you for the book of Zechariah, Lord, as, Lord, you, you want to tell us of things to come, Lord, and how you're going to do things, and how you would bring comfort to the Jews in their time, Lord. You also comfort us, Lord, through your promises to them, Lord, and so, Lord, will you help us, Lord, to be about your business um, so that we might see, Lord, um, just that, that Gentile bride, um, and, and, and Gentile Jewish bride that you've created into one person, Lord, made one man out of, Lord, in Christ. And so um, may we be about our business to share the good news. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you'd help our nation. Lord, help our country, help our world. Lord, have mercy, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Um, we'll catch you uh, on Sunday at 10.30 a.m.